Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. I'm Dennis Ward. Nunavut announced a presumptive case of COVID-19 at a remote mine site last week, but later testing couldn't confirm it. Now the same mine has two presumptive cases, but the government says they're not connected. Ken Driscoll has the story. Nunavut health officials took questions today following an announcement of two presumptive positive tests for COVID-19 at the Mary River Iron Ore Mine. Two out of territory workers at the mine have tested positive, and while we wait the confirmed results from the south, we must treat these as presumptive. So we're operating under the assumption for now that these individuals are, are still, uh, could still transmit COVID-19 to other people and taking every precaution to minimize the chance of further spread. The Mary River Iron Ore Mine is located about 160 kilometers south of Pond Inlet, Nunavut. No Nunavut residents have been on site since March to prevent the spread of COVID-19 into communities. Last week, there was another positive test at this mine that was later retested and determined to be negative. Dr. Patterson is confident the two are not connected. With what we know right now, the best explanation is that the transmission occurred either outside of the mine or not between uh, our first presumptive and either of these two people, simply because they had no uh, contact at the mine site uh, that could have accounted for the results that we got yesterday and the day before. Mine workers do not have to isolate for two weeks before traveling to the Nunavut mine sites. Nunavut's mines are paying their Nunavut-based employees to stay home. The big question remaining? The mines can't pay staff for not working forever. And with no clear end for COVID-19 in sight, how long can they continue to do so? Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. Ontario has become the latest to end birth alerts. The controversial practice that involves children's aid societies notifying hospitals when they believe a newborn baby may be in danger. Birth alerts disproportionately impact Indigenous and marginalized communities, and ending the practice was among the recommendations of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry. Ontario will end the alerts on October 15th of this year. Jill Dunlop, the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues, said her government made the decision after listening to community members and service providers. We were hearing firsthand that this practice was taking place and it, um, you know, it's, it's traumatic for moms, for, for children and for families too. So it's one of the first steps in the uh, child welfare uh, modernization that we are doing. And, you know, we're trying to work to, um, uh, you know, collaborate with families, that families have a voice in their, their plans moving forward and birth alerts just do the exact opposite. On a First Nation in southern Alberta, there have been six opioid-related deaths in just five weeks. Officials say the overdose rate has spiked significantly during the COVID-19 pandemic. As Tamara Pimentel reports, the Pekinese Nation is calling for action by the Canadian government. On the Pekinese Nation, dozens quietly gather for a powerful photo. Indigenous and non-Indigenous but all have one thing in common. They've lost someone to an overdose, including elder Jordan No Chief. I just lost my, my granddaughter, buried her last week. This crisis that's been happening to us, it's really devastating. This is like every day we're having funerals for our younger people. It's an issue in all communities. But First Nations die from opioid poisoning at a rate four times higher. On Pigani, there have been six opioid-related deaths in just five weeks. One overdose happened at the wake of another victim. Pigani crisis worker Margaret Potts has been on the front lines dealing with the coronavirus. She says overdose rates have risen significantly with the pandemic. And these families demand that this crisis get the same attention as COVID-19. No chief says more Indigenous health workers are needed. Action should be taken from our leadership right up to the government. We just recently lost uh, a mom a couple of weeks ago. We um, buried her and her family's here. 
This memorial photo was organized by Mom Stop the Harm, a network of Canadian families impacted by substance use. It's the first time the organization gathered on a First Nation. They all have shared the same common ground of having a loss regarding drug use. So I think that's big. We all need to support each other. Just this past week, there has been one confirmed case of COVID-19 on Bigani, lengthening the time without ceremony and creating even more tension in the community. No chief says as Bigani deals with two crises, he prays for those struggling. It's a very lonely life once you start on your healing journey. But you have to understand to trust yourself and to love yourself and then, you know, most of all, respect yourself. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News on the Bigani First Nation. It's been 30 years since what became commonly known as the Oka crisis. But how much changed on the ground in that time? That story and much more still to come. Welcome back. It all started with the expansion of a nine-hole golf course into a Mohawk burial site. 30 years ago this past weekend, a firefight between Mohawks of Ganesatage and Quebec Provincial Police left an officer dead. The 78-day standoff that followed, commonly called the Oka Crisis, left a legacy with land issues that have yet to be resolved. Tom Fenario has the story. This convoy, over 100 vehicles long, is rolling along Highway 344. If this hill looks familiar, there's good reason. 30 years ago, this hill was the site of a 78-day standoff. Most know it as the Oka Crisis. But for Mohawks here, it's called the Siege of Ganasatage. They want people to get hurt over a golf course. The native people are fed up with being pushed around and our land taken. We're tired of that. We're taking a stand. Helen Gabriel was a spokesperson at the Ganasatage Barricade in 1990. Saturday, she found herself fulfilling that duty once again. Our ancestral lands still face theft and dispossession. Our traditional governments, delegitimized by colonial created political entities by the governments of Canada and Quebec. And this ain't a surrender either. The siege may have ended three decades ago, but for many who lived it, it's never been resolved. A recent sore point is the continued construction of condos in Oka, which is a part of Ganasatage's land claim. The development we protested three years ago, which the government of Canada has refused to intervene. Ganasatage Grand Chief Sel Simon says the most recent incarnation of land claim negotiations have been ongoing for nine years and counting. The repatriation of uh, available lands, yes, that's one of the sticking points. And. Um, there is an obligation by the Crown whenever the, uh, these lands are available and uh, are undeveloped. Uh, they do have the, ju the justification to uh, compensate the third party and get them off uh, our Aboriginal title. The Band Council has been heavily criticized lately by fellow Ganasatage members over the opacity of negotiations. Jeremy Tomlinson recently co-authored a letter demanding transparency over the land claim process. This is not customary at all for us. So your job, if you represent me and this community at a negotiation table, you go, you get the information, and you come back. Because how can you negotiate when you don't even know the position of the people? How can you represent that position when you don't know what it is, when we haven't told you? For his part, Simon says Canada's negotiation policies leave him stuck between a rock and a hard place. We have a confidentiality agreement with the feds. The policy of Canada says, you gotta, you gotta keep the community informed. But then, if you inform the community too much, oh, you're in breach. And if you don't, can, if you don't inform them enough, then, well, we have another problem. So I'm sick and tired of it. Simon adds there are negotiations scheduled towards the end of the month. Meanwhile, if Saturday's anniversary events are any indication, Kanasatage may have some allies in Ottawa. 
NDP leader Yagmeet Singh pledged support, saying that as an opposition party in a minority government, he wants to make a difference. The Liberal government can use, uh, can count on me as an ally. I've made it really clear this is an important issue for me. And so if they need to pass any legislation, I am there to help pass that legislation. Ellen Gabriel posed for a picture of Singh while holding the two-row treaty wampum belt. Originally made with the Dutch over 400 years ago, the two-row is named for the two purple lines between three white to express independence between nations. As Gabriel explained, the two purple lines travel down the river of life together, but never do they intersect. To honor and respect each other's differences, to honor and respect each other's ways of doing things, to not interfere. After 400 years of the two-row treaty, and now the 30th anniversary of the siege of Ganasatage, Ellen Gabriel is clearly tired of waiting. What we're saying to, to the Canadian citizen is wake up. We want our land back. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Ganasatage, Mohawk Territory. The Bill Reed Gallery of Northwest Art in Vancouver is unveiling its newest edition, which will honor the 100th birthday of its namesake. And as Sarah Connor shows us, the exhibit looks at much more than Reed's art. Bill Reed was Canada's most acclaimed Haida artist. He passed away in 1998 at the age of 78. But now his work and the man behind it can be seen like never before. Right here is the Mythic Messengers bracelet, which is on loan to the gallery and just one of the most uh, spectacular pieces I've ever seen. Bill Reed was an acclaimed Haida master artist and is credited with reviving Haida art. He's best known for his large sculptures housed in prolific places, like the Jade Canoe in Vancouver International Airport. Now an exhibition at the Northwest Art Gallery will honor him in celebration of what would have been his 100th birthday. The exhibit, To Speak with a Golden Voice, will feature rarely seen treasures of Reed's and works from artists inspired by him. He also was instrumental in, in sharing Haida culture and Northwest Coast art with the world. So he's, he's kind of cemented into our firmament in that way, or, or, or say the, uh, of Canada uh, in that way, as, a, as many people's introduction to what Northwest Coast art is. Haida artist and filmmaker Gwai Inshaw took a major role in assembling the exhibit. I learned to walk the day that his pole went up. Edenshaw's father worked with Reed, and when Edenshaw was a teenager, he lived with the artist and is considered his last apprentice. To speak with a golden voice also shined a light on the complexities of Reed's personality, like his reputation for being a gentle jokester. It is a funny thing working with him. He was able to find humor in all kinds of moments. I think that it shines through even as in his work, but his sense of humor is definitely uh, an aspect of, of Bill's that I, that I think needs to be remembered anyways. To speak with a golden voice isn't just about his legacy as an artist, but also his legacy as a human being. Most of what we ever get to see about Bill is you know, in these clean and finished uh, products that he made. This show is more about who he was. So if people are, are curious about getting to know about Bill as a man, as a person, then, then there's a little more opportunity inside of this show. In August, the museum is going to hold a birthday batch for Reed, which will include a day of virtual artist demonstrations and exhibition tours. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Vancouver. Time for another quick break, and then we'll take a look at sports teams being forced to finally change their names and at combating COVID-19 misconceptions. Stick around. Welcome back. The Canadian Football League's Edmonton franchise have closed their survey with key audiences and shareholders. The survey was supposed to help decide if they should keep the team name. 
called racist and offensive in the wake of Black and Indigenous Lives Matters demonstrations in the U.S. and Canada. Michelle Karlinzig has that story for us. When Edmonton launched a survey this week asking if their name is racist, Twitter users were outraged. The questions were biased and leading, they said. Like this one. Do you believe that when the name was originally chosen, the intent was to be disrespectful of Inuit or Indigenous people? This is not Edmonton's first survey. They sent delegates to Inuit communities in October 2019 to ask what the people thought of the name. They released the results in this year's annual report. 78% opposed the name change in the Western Arctic. In Nunavut, 55% opposed the change. In the Eastern Arctic, 69% said keep the name. Not very convincing, says Mumala Kakak, member of parliament for Nunavut. If a CFL team who makes a ton of money off of a derogatory term that Inuit and our ancestors have based for decades, well then really where are we in 2020 and what does that mean for our future? Right now is a really huge opportunity to be able to shift how we think and how we perceive stereotypes and assumptions of Indigenous peoples and Inuit. Jordan Tutu is retired now, but he was the first Inuk to crack an NHL lineup playing in the league for 723 games over 15 seasons. The Eskimos team name is not objectionable to me. That does not mean they should keep the name, but I think the discussion should be around how Inuk people feel about it. Some might feel pride, some might feel hurt. Either way, that should be the group that is consulted about it. Washington's NFL team is dropping their name and logo after pressure from the Black and Indigenous Lives Matter movement, and because major sponsors said they would pull their money if they didn't make the change. In Edmonton, the latest survey went up one day and was gone the next. At least two major sponsors said they would pull their money too if the name was not changed. The team says the results of their one-day review will be published in two weeks. Michelle Karlenzig, APTN National News, Winnipeg. And on Thursday, media reported that the team has made a decision to change the name. An announcement could come as early as next week. APTN contacted the team. A representative says the team is not commenting on those reports and says they have no updates at this time. Well, we'd like to hear what you think about the potential name change. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest Indigenous news. Well, offensive team names and mascots have been the focal point of criticism for years. From major cities to small towns, teams are deciding to change their names one by one. But as Daryl Stranger tells us, a Manitoba team is still fighting to keep their name, which others deem offensive. The Morden Redskins senior men's team have been a part of the Southeastern Manitoba Hockey League since 1986. They have used the same name every year in the league since, and have not looked at a name change despite past and present calls for a change. The general manager of the team, Brent Mellick, is from Swan Lake First Nation. He feels the name is a sign of respect, not disrespect. From my perspective, I think it shows a lot of respect. I think uh, when we're out there and we're playing hockey, it's just it, it, it's bringing it's a good vibe. It's always been a good vibe with the Morton Redskins name. Um, people think it's offensive because it's in the dictionary or wherever it is that it says it's a racial slur. I mean, that's not our intention at all. I mean, we're completely opposite of that. A push was made five years ago to change the name, but the name stuck. City of Morden Mayor Brandon Burley says he had no education of the hurt that the name caused during that time, but that he's learned from the past and hopes to be a part of the solution moving forward. Uh, the name has hurt and continues to hurt. And certainly as, as a public official, as a person who's elected to represent the entirety of the city, uh, I will stand up for the rights of all, including our Indigenous community. But I also want to point out that I'm not um, preaching from a soapbox. I'm pointing three fingers squarely back at myself when I'm pointing one at the name. Burley added that the city would be willing to assist in funding should the team decide to change names. 
certainly offered to help ensure that funding was present for them and to do that fundraising effort and even help out of my own pocket. Um, that is certainly a thing I think council, the city, I've had very positive conversations with people who have been supporters of our men's hockey team in the past and would love to have a hockey team to support moving forward. Of course, we have no senior team except for this one and hockey is sacrosanct in Canada. And I think that we would love to have a team to cheer for and a Jersey and a name and a logo and a brand that's truly reflective of our community values. Malik says the team is currently conducting a review, but it will not be complete in the immediate future. I mean, obviously, we need to uh, review all of our stuff again, and uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go from there. Um, keep everything positive, and I, I think we'll, we'll we'll come up with a good result. I have a good feeling about it. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. Ryan McMahon singing and drumming about COVID-19. It could be a possible hit this summer. At least the National Association of Friendship Centers hope so. They just debuted the comedian doing just that. And as Todd Lamoran reports, it's all to tackle misconceptions about the virus. The sweat lodge is a safe place as long as I'm acknowledging they are away from me. The spirit of that virus. COVID-19. That'll keep me safe. Jocelyn Formsma wants to stamp out fallacies about COVID-19. Put out the myth, bust the myth, and, and have a couple of laughs while we're doing it, right? She says there's too many falsehoods about the virus on social media. We've heard some around um, direct sunlight and heat killing and, and using different kinds of vitamins and um, that, uh, well, can they be spread through mosquitoes and, and all kinds of things. To combat that, the National Association of Friendship Centers just put out its first 30-second spot and hopes to do six or seven more. We're looking at the virus as a trickster. Um, it, it wants to trick us into using us as its vehicle to get around and, and to spread and to grow. So we want to stop that trickster as soon as we can so it doesn't wreak any more havoc in our communities. Ryan McMahon has been making Indigenous people laugh for decades and has also been involved with the Friendship Centre movement. In terms of being a trusted voice, in terms of being um, someone who knows Friendship Centres and also could appeal to our community members, um, he seemed like the natural choice to, to have as, as part of this. Formsma believes people will find the ads memorable. We've heard a lot of positive comments and, and people finding the song really catchy and we're hoping that that's the, <laughs> the song that people are singing this summer. <laughs> In addition, Formsma, McMahon and Dr. Janet Smiley will be holding a Facebook Live on July 22nd. They're calling it a kitchen table talk and hope to bust more COVID-19 misconceptions. Todd Lamoran, APTN National News, Ottawa. It could be the song of the summer. That's all the time we have for APTN National News Weekend. For more on these and other stories, visit our website aptnnews.ca and never miss a story by downloading the aptn news app i'm dennis ward thanks for tuning in have a great weekend